Well, welcome back. This is the uh, second of six videos looking at uh, Chapter 13 from Wheeler's most excellent textbook uh, on a security risk management. What we're going to be doing during this particular video is looking at this idea of an uh, architectural hierarchy. So uh, the idea here is to uh, link together through a supporting uh, series of documents uh, in, in increasing detail the architecture of the entire organization. And as you can see in the diagram uh, to the uh, right there, we're going to start with that enterprise information security policy. And that provides that business conceptual layer and the vision of where we're trying to take security. So this is going to be the uh, overarching uh, document or series of documents with uh, processes that allow us uh, to describe where we want to go within our architecture to support risk management and security. From there, we're going to build uh, a target uh, security architecture. And if you will, these are going to be our design principles, our security uh, objectives, the rules by which we make uh, decisions. Okay, So that's going to be that security conceptual uh, level. And uh, as it says over on the left, that target architecture is meant to guide the development of more specific documents. So it's not as broad as the security vision and enterprise information security uh, policy, but what it does is it, it gets into how are we going to make decisions uh, within this? What objectives are we trying to achieve and what are the rules we're going to use uh, to make those decisions? From there, we're going to move down to the reference security architecture. So we've moved from policy to a target security architecture to a reference security architecture. And again, we're going to get more detailed and provide uh, a methodology to apply the rules. Um, it's all, you know, which zones are we going to have? What access control model are we going to use? And then functional requirements associated with security controls. All right. From there, we move into uh, the idea of security technology layer. And then from there, we move down to the security implementation uh, layer. And these are going to be tied to very specific implementations. All right, so let's um, uh, go forward a slide here. As you can see, as we start to get into the security architecture uh, patterns, uh, we're getting into specific environments and we're translating the reference architecture into technical level specifications for the system. In other words, how do we build the system? What tools do we put together? What other third parties do we need to integrate in to have the appropriate controls and security around the system? It's also going to address any specific um, uh, considerations that are unique or, or uh, differential uh, in the data and, and resources that are associated with that particular uh, implementation. All right, and then finally, we're moving down into design patterns. Um, so these are going to be very uh, detailed uh, designs that specify the designed products uh, that meet the higher level architectural goals. Ideally, it's modular so that it can be reused, and it's typically not considered part of the architecture. So we move out of architecture into design when we get into the security implementation uh, layer type, uh, very specific, uh, this is how we're going to build things. And so, as you can see, we're starting at the top with policy. We're moving through a series of documents that move from, um, if you will, uh, global to very specific down to actual implementations and the rules around those implementations. And this gives us that underlying architecture hierarchy that we need um, to have a, a solid foundation for our security operations. All right, uh, sometimes as we're doing this, we're going to have to do a, a mitigation uh, strategy. All of us have legacy systems, uh, well, unless you're a startup. Uh, but most uh, organizations have legacy systems that you're going to have to integrate in, and you're going to have exceptions and other mechanisms that you're going to have to put into place to mitigate and control risk as you deal with those legacy systems. It could be that a previous system simply does not have 
the capability for doing um, uh, the functionality uh, that you're de uh, defining in your architecture. And you're going to have to do some wrap, uh, uh, containers or wrappers or other mechanisms to protect uh, that underlying system. As you're looking at uh, principles that you're going to make in terms of uh, doing this implementation, obviously you're going to align by the policies, and that's pretty explicit when you look at how the uh, uh, architectural hierarchy plays out. You start with enterprise policy and work down. That drives the selection and implementation of different controls. Those decisions have to be risk-based so as to generate, to address the appropriate risk and to generate business value. Again, we do not do security for security's sake. Uh, as you're looking at technical controls going in place, you've got to put managerial and operational controls in place as well. You need to specify uh, criteria and metrics that allow you to evaluate how well things are going. And ideally, all of these systems are done so that they're modular. This is daunting. A lot of those integrations uh, and security controls. Some of them are standalone and they're very modular and other the others make a very deep and permanent penetration and change into other systems. And so when you pull one out, you've got a gap in the other system and you've got to be careful. Those take uh, a significant amount of time to work and those kind of dependencies uh, sometimes limit the organization. So while we want modularity it is a goal. It is not always achieved based on the design of those controls, and modularity should guide which controls we actually put into place. Uh, this idea of separation uh, by risk is just a foundational principle that you always want to uh, consider as you're building a system. So security zones, for example. Uh, is a good idea, taking a network and splitting it out so that you have a research network, an academic network, a Internet of Things network, uh, a hospital network. And each of those have different characteristics um, that you want to put like resources together in terms of, when I say like, in terms of having the same risk profile and potentially business function. So again, that network example is a good uh, example of that. The boundary between those security zones is controlled by security controls. Okay, so you have a set of rules that govern the information that feeds back and forth uh, between those zones and mediate so that you do not um, create a back door into a security zone and you do, do not create uh, unwarranted access to sensitive resources. Uh, sometimes you can do that virtually. Uh, through uh, a virtual LAN uh, capability. Uh, sometimes you're going to do it physical. You're actually going to put it on completely separate fiber um, because you want that level of control. If you look at the, the uh, military, they have a uh, cipernet and a nippernet. They have a non-sensitive uh, internet connection and they have a sensitive or secret internet connection. And those two networks are, are physically separated uh, and their information is not intended to pass between the two uh, networks. All right, when we're looking at the boundary for a security zone, it's going to be defined by those controls that I talked about, how strong is the uh, enforcement of those, and what traffic you either allow or prevent through access control list uh, rules. Uh, so again, here's an example uh, of pop that, that graphic of uh, moving things into uh, restricted, trusted. DMZ stands for uh, demilitarized zone. You've got an untrusted zone, a managerial zone, and an audit uh, zone. Uh, you may have subzones within that. So for example, do you really want your university's uh, enterprise servers in the same zone as the normal user laptop, uh, you know, mobile connection guest network? Absolutely not. You want them in there's you want them in a different uh, zone. Uh, so again, as you're making these uh, zone decisions, uh, you're trying to avoid exposure to risk by putting similar resources with the same similar risk profiles in the same zones. You want to avoid uh, transitive risk um, or imposing risk on other resources by grouping them inappropriately, and you want to make sure that you meet business requirements. Uh, when required by a dedicated environment.
Users should remain in their own zone separate from any services, and applications should be in a zone uh, for providing those services. Again, as I was talking about, you don't want to intermingle those two. Their risk profiles are just foundationally different, and you want to build the zones so that they capture that foundational difference in the services or the traffic that's being provided. So you can see some of the uh, 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 components over there of user space decisions of how you might uh, uh, spread things out. And again, as you're making these decisions, um, you don't have to do all of this at one time, but you may want to start by separating internal, external traffic, and then from there, taking the internal traffic and splitting it out uh, according to some of these uh, user space decisions that are listed here on the slide. All right, finally, as you're looking at movement between those zones, um, the uh, uh, security controls have to be in place to protect the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and accountability um, of the information. And that is uh, often uh, uh, dictated by what is the highest level um, um, sensitivity of a security zone risk profile and how do you protect that. So again, if you think about it, if you've got a hospital, they're involved with clinical trials, that involves personal health information, so uh, HIPAA applies. Um, a university and a hospital are probably going to use the same uh, shared resource of a research, high performance research computer or a supercomputer. You have to figure out a path to move the data securely into that high performance computer and then back out um, where there's no residue left on the high performance computer that could be exploited. So again, that data movement between zones is natural. It needs to happen. We don't want to limit our users from doing it, but we have to protect the security of the, uh, the underlying data as it's moving forward between the initiator and the uh, recipient of the data. All right, well, guess what? That brings us to the end of the second of six videos looking at Chapter 13 from Wheeler's most excellent textbook, uh, Security Risk Management. Next lesson, we're going to continue uh, this uh, exploration of information flows. So keep on studying, keep on learning, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.